Good morning. Welcome to Knox this morning. Uh, it is um, hard to believe it's December out there, but we are spoiled. We have all grown up with snow in December and things seem to be a little bit different and changing these days. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us on YouTube and we hope that you enjoy the service today and that it blesses you in, in its message. We look forward to seeing you to joining us someday. Our Christmas Eve services tonight are provided by The Well at 4 o'clock here. Remember, correction on the postcard. 4 o'clock by The Well. And I, I don't have a card in front of me. Is it 9 or 9.30? 9.30 down the road at Carluke. So uh, those are two options. And if you have family or someone else that you would be joining Christmas Eve service, we pray your blessing on, on that service as well. Tomorrow morning, we are here at 11 o'clock for, uh, we'll probably meet just in the round here Christmas morning uh, at uh, 11 o'clock for a casual service. I don't have any other announcements. Um, I'm going to have uh, Cody and Bryn come to the front to lead us in the lighting of the fourth Advent candle. Now, we, I've done it a little bit differently this morning because person one and person two has been causing a bit of confusion. We're so used to our call to worship where we just kind of go back and forth and back and forth, but the the uh, way it's written up, it sometimes repeats person one or it repeats person two. So they're going to help guide you, and they will let you know which one they are. And then the, the lighter is right right there for the fourth, the third purple candle, the uh, candle of um, love this morning. Uh, yes. He's number one. <laughs> the fourth Sunday in Advent love. The prophets call and the psalmists sing to announce that God is love. For the maiden may depart and the hills may be moved, but my steadfast love shall never depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Give thanks to the Lord, who is good. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, whose steadfast love endures forever. From the mystery of God's love came our creation, and we are nourished daily by it. The power of God's love is transformative because we have received God's love and we cannot remain the same. Love means seeking the best for others. Love is compassionate for all creation. Love speaks the truth with kindness. Love is the way of seeing others as God sees them. Holy I don't, it's my bad. Holy are you, source of all new life among us. Jesus Christ is the love of God come into the world. We join with all creation and lift our hearts in joyful praise. We light this candle to burn for love. Let's pray. God of mercy and majesty, you are powerful, you are holy, you are loving. You come among us not as a warrior or a tyrant, but as a child, new life born among us, reaching out to embrace us in love. 
We come to you this day. We offer you our love for all that you have been, all that you are, and all that you will be. Creator, Christ, and Spirit, one God, holy and loving, now and forevermore. Amen. We, are, we will sing away in a manger, and then there is another prayer. So if you're able to say, remain standing, and then there's a third song. He came in uh, innocence and vulnerability. God of mystery and mercy, you came to offer us love. But we confess we can be stubborn and selfish in the ways we live. You came to reconcile all people, but we nurse grudges and we resist repairing relationships. Forgive who we have been, amend who we are, and direct who we shall be through Jesus Christ who reaches out to us from the manger and the cross. Amen. Mary, did you know? The fourth Sunday in Advent celebrates God's love. And uh, thank you for your gifts of offering today that express your love for God. And for those in God's world who need love to brighten difficult times. As the baskets are, are at the front, if, if you so wish to um, make an offering in that regard. And we thank you for the other ways that you've made donations through our missions projects uh, throughout the year. Let us give thanks. Lord, you have blessed us, and in turn, we use that blessing and pass it on that you may bless others. We so often take that for granted and don't realize and don't remember, but this time of year helps us focus in on that once again. God of all ages, the stories of this season are familiar. To so send your spirit to give us a fresh understanding of your significance. Make us attentive to Jesus, the living word, and gifts he brings into our midst every day. Amen. Well, good morning and blessed Christmas Eve. Um, morning, that is. I just, uh, on behalf of Henry and myself, I just want to thank you. So many of you have reached out with cards and kind words and um, blessings and greetings for the season. And uh, we just feel really blessed. And it uh, also makes us feel very much a part of this family. So uh, we love our family here. And we want to just take a moment to, to thank you for that. Let's, uh, let's come to our God in prayer this morning. Father, as we come, as we adore you, we enter into that place where you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, dwell among us, dwell within us. We worship you. You are our God of peace, hope, joy, love. You are the Messiah, the Christ, the one who is worthy of all praise. You are the King of kings. You're the beginning, the end, the Alpha, the Omega. You are everywhere and you are in everything. You know all things. You are all things. It's incredible. It's incredible that one so mighty would come down in the flesh and live with us. It's incredible that as broken as we are, as sinful as we are, you come to us with grace and love. 
You humbled yourself and became one of us. We worship you, almighty God. And we thank you for all that it is that you have done in and through our lives and for our lives. And Father, it is because of how you came and showed us your love that we come to you with thanksgiving and with praise. May our songs be pleasing to you. May the hearts that we offer and all the things that we do to live for you be pleasing to you. And Lord, it is because of your graciousness toward, you, uh, toward us that we're able with confidence to come before your throne and say, Lord, we need you. We need you every moment. We need you in this broken world filled with an earth that is crying out, filled with war and pain, filled with sickness and disease. We need you. And Father, each one of us here needs you in a different way. We, we pray that you would take all the prayers that are on our hearts, all our concerns, we lay them now before your throne. We pray for Jessica and the Powell family as they celebrate Christmas in the midst of cancer treatments and all that that means. We pray, Lord, that your incarnation may come into their lives in a very special way this year. We pray for those Lord, of us who um, endure pain, who endure eyesight issues, heart issues, chronic issues, the reality that comes with aging, Lord, all of these things remind us that we are mortal. And yet, because of your wonderful, glorious power that raised you from the dead, we know and have confidence that we, too, will have life forever. But we thank you and we praise you for that. Lord, on this Christmas day, may we not only receive blessing, but may we share our blessings. Our blessings of words, our blessings of good deeds, our blessing of raising up prayers. What a privilege it is to be a part of your kingdom and to be called as your servants. To do good works that our faith may be made real. Lord, as we think about all the things that we've done over this past year through ministry and for each other, would you multiply that? And may your gospel go out. And may all people bend the knee and declare, Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Well, we're continuing our series then and now. This morning we look at why has Christ come? And so I invite our first reader just to share our Christmas story, Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quinius was governor of Syria. And everyone, went, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem in the town of David because he belonged to the house of the, and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch, watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. <coughs> Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who had heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasure, treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Christmas traditions. You're into them, right? There's certain things that you do every Christmas, like coming and worship, maybe watch certain movies. I think about, you know, 134th Street, the nice Santa Claus story. Is Santa Claus real? Well, the post office says he is. Or maybe your Christmas tradition is to watch Scrooge, just so that you're reminded of how to give over the season. One of the other favorites is It's a Wonderful Life, where George Bailey, during Christmas time, is one of those people who is having a very blue Christmas and actually thinks that his life isn't worth very much. But an angel Clarence comes to George Bailey and says, if you had not been alive, you would have missed out on all the fruit of your life. And he takes him through his whole life. It's a heartwarming story. And it causes us to reflect on how our lives make a difference, how every life makes a difference. Now, this morning we might want to think about, did Jesus' life make a difference? My dad asked this question, did his life make a difference? On this December 24th morning at 725, 20 years ago, my dad passed away. So I've been reflecting on him quite a bit this past week. And I recall that while he was suffering with cancer, he was asking all the big questions in life. He was a faithful man, fairly ordinary Dutch farming type, a little rough around the edges. He was by no means perfect. But he asked a question when our family was together one day. Did my life bear any fruit? I know that dad came to a place of peace as he found that answer. I don't know what it was for him, but I started to reflect on that question an awful lot. How do you know if your life bears fruit? It weighed on me. I will say right now, I don't believe that this is necessarily the word of God, but it helped me. I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw that dad had come and met his eternal God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit met him and said, welcome to eternal life. And the Lord showed my dad a train that just went as far as the eye could see. And it was full of grain. And the Lord picked up my dad and put him on a grain car. And dad said, Lord, what is this? He said, John, this is, like, look at it. Every, every little kernel of wheat is a fruit that you bore in your life. And dad said, well, what do you mean? Well, the Lord said, every kind word, every time you were loyal, every time you did things for other, every time you said a kind word, every time you took care of your family, everything you did for the Lord was fruit. 
And dad goes, Lord, that's amazing. This whole car is for me. And the Lord said, no, John, the whole train. That dream shifted what, for me, what it meant to live for the Lord. You know that everything that we do makes a difference. Everything that we say, if we do it unto the Lord, makes a difference. The Lord makes it bear fruit. What difference does a life make is a valid question. Like what difference did the birth of Jesus Christ make for the world uh, when there's so much sin and destruction and war and sickness and pain and the earth is groaning, we might cry out, Lord, like you came, why, why are we still living with all this stuff? Did you make any difference? I'm not trying to compare Jesus' life with suicidal George Bailey, but what if we watched the movie entitled is it a wonderful life if Jesus had not come? Well, let's consider that. First, if Jesus had not come on that Christmas day long ago, we would remain under the law. The Ten Commandments was God's way of showing us what it takes to live for him in perfect holiness. Well, we're not very good at that, are we? The Apostle Paul reminds us that each and every one of us falls short of the glory of God, meaning we all fall short of God's standard. And Jesus reiterated this as he taught, you know, if you even think lustfully about someone who's married, you may not have acted on it, but you've already committed adultery. Or if you're angry with someone, you have already murdered them in your heart. Well, that pretty much shows us that there's no way any of us can keep the law. And some people might fool themselves saying, oh, that person or I will get to heaven because I'm a good person. If we were to put that into God terms, it would sound something like, I don't sin. I can stand in front of God on my own terms. I don't need Jesus. Maybe we better take a step back and see whether or not being good is good enough. Do you really feel that God won't hold you accountable even for the smallest thing? You see, when we reflect on our own need for evil to be judged and sentenced, we need to understand that the Lord who is holy and perfect also demands that kind of justice when stuff happens. We would flounder under the law if Jesus had not come and by grace saved us from what we could never attain. And so second, if Jesus had not come, there would be no salvation from sin. We're powerless to help ourselves. Let's admit it. Last week we reflected on how we have these habitual routines that we know we should get rid of, but we just don't have the energy to do it. We do the things we should not be doing, says Paul, and there's a whole lot of stuff we should be doing that eh, we just don't feel like doing. Our lazy nature refuses to engage in actively trying to fight against sin and temptation. Temptation. You see, laziness is a choice, a choice to do nothing but follow instinct. Our human nature, or as scripture calls it, follow the ways of the flesh. And to live by the flesh is to declare independence from God and even from other people. It's what God says is rebellion. It's sin. So it's not cliche for us to reflect this morning that Jesus was born so that he might die. The glory of Christmas culminates in the suffering and death of Jesus Christ on Good Friday and triumphs on Easter morning when he rises from the dead. Christ was born so that through his death, and resurrection, our sin and sentencing was paid for. Christ fulfilled the law. Thus, Jesus' coming freed us from guilt, from shame, from the impending judgment, from our own evil. Jesus came so that we might have life and have it abundantly and to experience freedom. 
for Christ has said, I haven't come for the people who think they're good. I have come for sinners, and I come to save, not to condemn. Well, third, if Jesus had not come, then death would have the victory. I would have no joy in knowing that my dad was with his heavenly father. I would have very little comfort. As it is with Christ's resurrection, death has lost its sting. We no longer need to fear death because death is the doorway into eternal life. We would have no future without Jesus for eternal life would then be complete separation from God. Or, ultimately, as the Bible refers to it in different ways, H-E double hockey sticks. Hell. Because Jesus came with the hope of eternal life, and that is to know God and the Son whom he has sent. That's eternal life. It's this, this vision of a perfect, incredible relationship of unending, unconditional love. Well, fourth, if Jesus had not come, there's a fourth, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You can't even name them all. But very briefly, we'd still be waiting for a Messiah king to rule in Israel. And as we've seen, kings, queens, rulers, dictators come and go, kingdoms rise and fall. It would not be lasting. We would never understand God's nature. For in the incarnation of Jesus, we see God. We see how much he loves. We heard his voice. We, we see his love, his compa compassion. We see that he heals. And one who reaches into our hearts and into those inmost conflicts and he touches it and he says, peace, be still. We would never have known a God who understands our suffering in our pain or our joy in our laughter, but because he was incarnate God, he related 100% to us because he was also 100% human. That Christ came brings us freedom. And Romans 8 verses 18 through 39 um, is going to speak to that. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of God, by the will of one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pain of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption into sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For this, for in this hope, we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. The word was growing. We who searched our hearts, sorry, he who searches our hearts, knows that the mind, the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. 
And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any change, any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, the sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face day death all day long. We are considered as sheep and slaughtered. <laughs> no, in all those these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Sorry, this brings me back to my talk. And um, this was this was a statement of his faith. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the presence nor, future, nor present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, neither anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. The word of the Lord and the comfort of our God. This text reiterates so many ways in which we are liberated to overcome so much. Our present suffering, knowing that creation will be liberated from decay. We're free to enjoy the fruits of the Spirit, faithfulness, self-control, kindness, patience, goodness, gentleness, joy, peace, love, for against, for against such things there is no law. We're free to enjoy that we are called God's children, his daughters, his sons. We're free to hope with the assurance that Christ will come again. That we have a Holy Spirit who intercedes for us in our weakness, weakest moments and communicates our greatest needs to God when we say, Lord, I, I don't know how to pray. The Holy Spirit does. It is a freedom in Christ that brings assurance that even the hard sufferings of life are worked out for our good. We have assurance that we are called by God. We are justified and we will be glorified. Actually, the text says we are glorified already. We're assured that God brings us good things and we will not be condemned. Above all, freedom is the comforting knowledge that we will never, ever be separated from God. Neither death nor life, angels, demons, the present, the future, the powers, neither height nor depth, nor 
anything in all of creation is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Clarence the angel in It's a Wonderful Life, after showing George what the world would be like if he had not been born, concluded, strange, isn't it? The each man's life touches so many other lives, and when he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? Well, Christ came. And when he died, it felt like a hole, but then he rose again, and he fills every hole in our life to such perfection and with such grandiose love. Do you know this Jesus? Do you desire this freedom? Then open your hearts to Christmas, to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For he came to save, not condemn. He came to bring peace, hope, love, joy, and everlasting life through Christ our Lord. Come, let us adore the light of the world. We're going to respond by standing for a moment and reciting a Christmas creed. We introduced that to the congregation last year, and uh, so join me as we say that again. I'm short a battery up here, Pam, so. <laughs> I believe in Jesus Christ and in the beauty of the gospel that began in Bethlehem. I believe in him who the kings of the earth ignored and the proud can never understand, whose path was among the common people, whose welcome came from those of hungry hearts. I believe in him who proclaimed the love of God to be invincible, whose cradle was a mother's arm, whose home in Nazareth had love for its only well who looked at men and made them see what his love saw in them, who by his love brought sinners back to purity and lifted human weakness up to meet the strength of God. I confess my everlasting need of God, the need of forgiveness for my greed and selfishness, the need of life for an empty soul, the need of warmth for a heart grown cold. I acknowledge the glory of all that is like Christ, the steadfastness of friends, the blessedness of home, the beauty of compassion, the courage of those who dare to resist all passion and hate. I believe that only by love expressed shall the earth at length be purified. I acknowledge in Christ a faith that sees beyond our present evil, and I pray that this redemption may begin in me now, in this Christmas season, as I pray. Thanks be to God. Let's remain singing, Light of the World, sing hallelujah. People of God go out and because Christ came, nothing will ever separate you from the love of God. Go in the hope, the love, the joy, and the peace of Christ in the name of the Father and of the Son and of his Holy Spirit.